Chapter Four of the Life and Adventures of Michael Armstrong, the Factory Boy. This is a LibriVox recording. Chapter Four: A Little Cottage Gossip, A Visit of Charity, Practical Benevolence. The promptitude of the measures taken by Mister Joseph Parsons to bring to effect the wishes of his master showed him to be deserving the post of confidence he held as principal superintendent of Sir Matthew Dowling's factory he lost not a moment in obtaining a short interview with one of the parish officers who was his particular friend and then made his way to hawksley lane with the intention of questioning the widowed mother of the two armstrongs as to the situation of her affairs and the particular species of misery from which she might at that precise moment be suffering the most the statement pronounced in sir matthew's kitchen respecting the general eligibility of hawksley lane as a place of residence was perfectly correct it was the most deplorable hole in the parish a narrow deep-rutted parish road too hopelessly bad to be indicted led from the turnpike down a steep hill to the town of ashley exactly at the bottom of the hill just at the point where every summer storm and winter torrent deposited their gatherings there to remain and be absorbed as they might began a long closely packed double row of miserable dwellings crowded to excess by the population drawn together by the neighbouring factories there was a squalid untrimmed look about them all that spoke fully as much of want of care as of want of cash in the unthrifty tribe who dwelt there it was like the moral delinquencies of a corporate body of which no man is ashamed because no man can be pointed at as the guilty one it was not the business of number one to look after the filth accumulated in front of number two and the inhabitants of number three saw no use in mending the gate that swung on one hinge because number four had no gate at all and the dogs and the pigs who made good their entry there of course found their way easy enough through the make-believe hedge which throughout the row divided one tenement from another the very vilest rags were hanging before most of the doors as demonstration that washing of garments was occasionally resorted to within crawling infants half-starved cats mangy curs and fowls that looked as if each particular feather had been used as a scavenger's broom shared the dust and sunshine between them while an odour which seemed compounded of a multitude of villainous smells all reeking together into one floated over them driving the pure untainted air of heaven aloft far beyond the reach of any human lungs abiding in hawksley lane where does widow armstrong live demanded mr parsons of a woman who was whipping a child for tumbling in the dunghill before number five in the back kitchen of number twelve please your honour replied the woman making a low reverence to the well-known superintendent number twelve why that's sykes tenement and they're on the ground floor themselves yes please your honour but since the rents have been raised by sir matthew the sykes have been obliged to let off the back kitchen and live in the front one why there's a matter of a dozen of em isn't there yes your honour they lies terrible close obstinate dolt heads that's just because they pretend to fancy that it is not good for the small children to work i know for certain that they have got two above five years that they won't send to the factory and then they have the audaciousness to complain that the rents are raised as if because they are above choosing to earn money in an honest way sir matthew was not to make what he could of his own tis disgusting to see such airs where people ought to be thankful and happy to get work that's quite true no doubt sir answered the woman continuing to shake and occasionally to slap the grub of a child she had taken off the dunghill but robert sykes children are very weakly and them as your honour talks of is almost too small though tisn't to be doubted that it is the bounden duty of us all to send em sooner than see em starve i fancy so indeed replied mr parsons adding with a finger pointed at the squalling child who still continued under the cleansing process above described and isn't it a comfort now mrs miller to get rid of the plague of em the woman ceased to shake her little boy and looking for a moment at the clear blue eyes that notwithstanding her rough discipline were very lovingly turned up to her face something like a shudder passed over her get along with you bill said she as if afraid that the blighting glance of the superintendent should rest upon him and then added as long as they so be very small your honour they can't do no good if they be sent stuff and nonsense there's ways to teach em but don't fancy that i want to send your brats confound em they're the greatest plagues in nature 
and nothing on god's earth but good-heartedness and love of his country could ever make sir matthew for one trouble himself or his men with any of their creatures number twelve is it where shall i find the widow armstrong yes please your honour you'll be sure to find her she's a cripple poor soul and can't stir she's made up her mind to go into the workhouse hasn't she demanded the manager have she indeed poor thing responded the woman in an accent of compassion i heard so as i come along and that's the reason i'm going to her our good sir matthew who to be sure is the kindest-hearted man in the whole world has taken a fancy to her boy and he'll be a father to him i'll be bound to say he will and that's why i think he'd like me to give her a call just to tell her not to fret herself about the workhouse if she don't like going there she needn't i dare say with such a good friend as she's got the woman stared at him with an air of such genuine astonishment that the superintendent felt disconcerted and turning abruptly away continued his progress down the lane by the time he had reached number twelve however he had begun to doubt whether his sudden appearance at the bedside of the widow armstrong might not produce an effect unfavourable to the object he had in view as sure as steam steam thought he she'll be more inclined to fancy that i am come scolding about the boys for something than to take her part or do her pleasure so i'll just say a civil word to the sykes and then stroll away till such time as the parish officers have been after her i'll engage for it that sam butchel won't let no grass grow under his feet after what i said to him and if i turn in when he's there as if to see what was going on it would certainly be more natural like and believable in accordance with this improved projet de charite mr joseph parsons walked on but he had not proceeded far ere on turning his head round to reconnoitre he perceived not the tall and burly sam butchel the overseer of the parish but the lean and lathy person of little michael advancing with an eager and rapid step towards his mother's dwelling so ejaculated the sagacious parsons here comes the charity job it would be worth a week's wages to hear him tell his own story mr joseph parsons had a napoleon-like promptitude of action which the unlearned operatives described by calling him a word and a blow man but which in reality often deserved the higher epithet above bestowed scarcely had the thought of overhearing little michael's tale suggested itself ere a sidelong movement ensconced him for a moment behind a favouring pigsty from whence unseen he watched the boy enter the door of number twelve again napoleon-like he remembered all he had heard from her neighbour concerning the position of the widow's dwelling-place and rightly judging that sykes's back kitchen must in some way or other be in condition to favour the emission of sound he troubled not the household by making his approaches through the principal entrance but striding over the inefficient fence of the tiny cabbage plot behind obtained a station as favourable to his purpose as he could possibly desire this was a nook between a protuberance intended for an oven and the window close beside the widow armstrong's bed from whence prophetic fate favouring the yet latent purpose of the manager had caused three panes to be extracted by a volley of pebbles intended for mother sykes's cat at least two months before to this safe and commodious crouching place he made his way just in time to hear the widow say understand one word of edward's story mike so sit down dear boy and tell me all why mother tis like a story-book and it's very fine to be sure but yet and the boy stopped short but yet you don't like it mike rejoined his mother that's what you was goin to say tell the truth my child and don't go to keep nothing from me that was it said mike ungrateful viper muttered the confidential superintendent between his closed teeth poor fellow poor dear michael exclaimed the woman soothingly it was hard to go to sleep without kissing mother wasn't it yes i didn't like that nor i didn't like being without teddy neither and i didn't like the grumpy old lady has come into the kitchen and abused me nor the gentlemen's servants either except the gardener and he took hold of my hand and led me along kind enough and i like molly too that she's as give me my supper and my bed and my breakfast this morning mother oh mother how i did long to bring away some of the milk and bread and butter home with me never think of such a thing for your life boy exclaimed the mother eagerly it would be thieving nothing else michael nothing more nor less than thieving 
never mention that again to me dear that's a darling i won't mother but i know i shall think of it every time i see them big pounds of butter and jugs of milk and minds how careful you be over your little scrimped bit in the broken saucer and how you drinks your drop of tea without ever having any milk at all never you mind that darling but what are they going to do with you mike and what for do they want to have you up at the great house tis a mystery to me and thankful as we ought to be for any help i can't say but i should be easier in my mind if i understood something about it impertinent hag growled the surly parsons from his lair does she think they are going to trap him like a rabbit for the sake of his skin but mother i don't understand anything about it myself said michael rather dolefully to this avowal no reply was made for some minutes upon which the superintendent grew impatient and stretching forward his neck a little contrived athwart the sheltering branches of an elder bush to peep through the broken window to the agent of sir matthew dowling's benevolence the sight that presented itself was really revolting though there may be others who would have been affected differently by it michael had flung himself across the bed his arms were thrown round his mother who was sitting upright with some piece of needlework in her hands and his dark curls set off in strong contrast the extreme paleness of the face that looked down upon him the widow armstrong was still rather a young woman and would still have been a very lovely one had not sickness and poor living sharpened the delicate features and destroyed the oval outline that nature had made perfect yet she had quite enough of beauty left to detain the eye and such a history of patient suffering might be read in every line of her speaking countenance that few ever looked upon her harshly spite of her extreme poverty too she was clean her cap was clean the bedclothes were clean and the pale hands too looked so very white that if mr parsons from his hiding-place had ventured to speak any opinion concerning her he would certainly have given utterance to the strong expression of indignation at the abominable air of delicacy which her appearance displayed she looked as if she were struggling with some painful feeling but did not weep though her boy did heartily for a little while she suffered his tears to flow without interruption or reproof and then she kissed him once twice thrice there now michael she said looking at him fondly have you not played baby long enough stand up darling and listen to me you don't seem over glad mike of this great change and if you did perhaps i would have been over sorry but sorrow would be sin for either of us when god has sent us help tis you that be the heartiest mike and tis you that want food the most growing at the rate you do and heart sore have i been at meal-times to see you so stinted so never let us trouble ourselves any more about the reasons for your getting so into favour but just thank god and be contented but mother how will you get on without me replied michael shaking his head i am sure that teddy can't make your bed as i do he hasn't the strength in his arms and who's to fetch water deed indeed mother you'd better thank sir matthew and say no unless he'll just please to let teddy go instead that won't do my dear child in any way tis i must watch poor edward little as i can do for him i don't think he'd like to part from me as long as god is pleased to let me stay that's true mother that's very true teddy would break his heart no no tisn't he shall be parted from you i'll show him how to make the bed if i can't come over myself but perhaps they'll let me mother what's the business that you'll have to do michael inquired the widow i haven't been told of any business yet replied the boy but you don't expect that you're going to be kept for nothing dear said the mother smiling tisn't for my work mother tis for the cow replied michael gravely the cow child what is it you and teddy have got into your heads about a cow a poor starved beast he says it was that wouldn't have frightened a mouse and you made it turn round mike that's all i can make out but he must be mistaken surely what was it you did about the cow darling at this question the boy burst into a hearty fit of laughter which to say truth offended the listening ears of mr joseph parsons still more than his weeping had done i'll do his business for him he may depend upon it thought he if master must have a charity job he must 
but it don't follow that the creature shan't be made to know himself just as well as if he was in the factory i'll be your overlooker yet master mike just as this prophetic sketching of the future had made itself distinctly visible to his mind's eye the bodily senses of the agent announced to him that the tranquil tete-a-tete -tete within the widow's chamber was disturbed by the entrance of persons whose voice and step announced that they were men mr parsons was at no loss to guess their errand here they come muttered he now we'll see how master butchel manages his job we be come to see said a gruff voice within the widow's chamber whether or no you be come to your senses mrs armstrong sir said the trembling woman in return you knows well enough what i means without my going into it again you knows well enough as i comes to talk to ye about the house again we've had larkins the baker coming to inquire if there's a parish pay to look to for your bill mrs armstrong and i have told him no not a farthing not the quarter of a farthing unless you'll come into the house the parish have gone on allowing you two shilling a week week after week god knows how long tis a perfect shame and imposition and the board says they won't do it no longer you and the boys too may come in if you will that's one thing but living here cramming em with as much wheat and bread as they'll eat without paying for it is another and it's what no honest parish don't tolerate i'll be bound to say now as you have brought up the scamps without their ever knowing the taste of gruel tell the truth did you ever take the trouble to make a drop of gruel for em as long as i had my legs to stand upon sir i never minded trouble and when my husband was living we did a deal better and i have done cooking for em then such as a few potatoes and a cabbage may be with a scrap of bacon on a sunday but from the hour he died we have never had a pot upon the fire that's what is to be so obstinate if you'd come into the house you'd see the pot upon the fire all day long most but the children would be in one room after they came from the factory and i should be in another pleaded the widow and i've got a few of the decent things as i married with when i came from service and it would be a grief to me to see em all sold if the parish don't sell em larkins the baker will you may take my word for that mrs armstrong replied the overseer however tis your business not mine here's a decent respectable man as is ready to take all you've got at evaluation fair and honourable but that's just as you please i only called as in duty bound to tell ye that the parish don't mean to continue no such extravagance as paying you two shillings a week no longer god help me answered the widow gently if tis his will that so it should be it would be a sin for me to complain that's vastly fine beant it said the brutal butchel and now let's hear what you'll be after sayin to master larkins for here he comes as sure as eggs be eggs an abrupt and most peremptory demand for three pounds two shillings and seven pence was here made by a sour-looking little man who entered the small room without ceremony making a group of intruders round the widow's bed equally unwanted and unwelcome her overtaxed courage seemed to fail for it was with something like a sob that she replied to his demand by saying i shall have twelve shillings to take for needlework when this is done and you shall have it every farthing sir if you'll be so merciful and who's to pay your rent mrs armstrong if i may be so bold said mr butchel the widow had not a word to say for herself and covering her face with her hands wept bitterly now's my time said parsons to himself as he stealthily crept from his hiding-place now for sir matthew's benevolence and in a minute afterwards his tall gaunt figure and hard countenance were added to the company the noise he made in entering caused the widow to uncover her eyes and it was with an emotion little short of terror that she recognized the tyrant at whose name her children's cheeks grew pale instinctively she stretched out her hand and took hold of that of michael who was still seated on the side of the bed but the boy shook it off as if his mother's love was a secret treasure that the overlooker must not see and suddenly standing up he remained with his eyes fixed on the ground and his hands hanging by his sides as if petrified hello why what's the matter now is all the parish come to wish joy to this good woman here said the overlooker with as jocund an air as he could persuade his iron features to assume wish her joy 
responded the well-tutored parish officer and for what mr parsons if you please for having an honest tradesman come upon her with the gripe of the law in hopes to get what's his own she's got into trouble i promise you and i don't very well see how she's to get out of it you don't say so said the confidential agent what is that you mr larkins coming to take the law of a poor body this way i didn't think you was so hard-hearted i don't deserve that character sir replied the baker sharply for though desired to call and enforce his claim by the parish overseer mr larkins knew not a word about sir matthew's scheme of benevolence and the proof that my heart isn't harder than other people's he continued is that i gave the widow here credit for what has been excepting a few ounces of tea her whole and sole living for months past and very kind of ye too observed the conciliating superintendent i should like to know then what became of all the money the two boys got besides your own needlework and of late two shilling a week from the parish beside observed mr butchel why that is rather puzzling i must say replied mr parsons but no matter for that no matter for that just now this family has got a kind friend i promise you yes but it does matter returned larkins it can't be right no how for me to be out of three pounds two shillings and seven pence and she with such lots of money indeed indeed sir said the widow once more looking up at him i have done my very best paying a little and a little at a time as you know i never stopped doing only for two weeks that my biggest that is my oldest boy was making up time that was lost when he was home sick and so got no wages but the seven shillings a week that they get between em and my uncertain bit of needlework gentlemen can't stand for food and clothes and rent and a little soap to keep us decent and a bit of firing to boil a drop of water it can't do all that gentlemen without getting behindhand when any making up time comes in the factory well then that's just the reason why you must come into the house replied butchel and at any rate you may depend upon getting no more money out of it upon hearing these words the decent respectable man who was willing to take the widow's goods at a valiation fair and honourable began examining the condition of a chair that stood near him an operation which the widow eyed with the most piteous look imaginable come into the house i tell you without more ado resumed butchel and what in god's name do you think we want you in for but your own good do you think the parish have a fancy for maintaining crippled women and children by way of pleasure tis ruination anyway but when you're in we know the worst of it at once and that's something the boys wages will go a bit to help and at any rate there'll be no two shillings to pay which is what the overseers hates above all things and what they won't continue to do so now i have said my say and here mr butchel began to move his heavy person towards the door stop a minute mr butchel if you please sir ejaculated sir matthew's superintendent i should be sorry to let you go back to your employers under any delusion or mistake whatever and the fact is that this good woman the widow armstrong is no more likely to go into the workhouse than you are yourself mr butchel begging your pardon for naming such a thing then i suppose as it's yourself as means to keep her out of it mr parsons replied the parish officer jocosely not exactly me myself replied the other in the same tone but it's one as much more able as he is willing it is sir matthew dowling as intends to befriend her and that not only on account of the general charitableness of his temper which all who know him really well are quite aware is very great but because that little boy as stands there and who is one of our factory children saved a friend of lady dowling's last night from something she looked upon to be a considerable danger and does sir matthew mean to see me paid demanded the baker upon my word mr larkin that's more than what i've got authority to say replied parsons but howsomever i don't think that you had best go on just at this particular minute to persecute about it seeing that in course sir matthew won't take it civil when he's being such a friend himself to the widow i don't want to do nothing uncivil to nobody replied the baker but i don't quite understand this business it is something new isn't it sir matthew setting up for a soft-hearted gentleman among the factory folks new to you may be mr larkin but not to me replied the trustworthy agent there isn't another to be found look which way you will that can be compared with sir matthew dolling for real true benevolent charitableness when he finds proper objects for it 
the baker stared the man of old chairs and tables scratched his puzzled head the intelligent mr butchel looked at the speaker with a knowing wink the widow fixed her eyes upon her patchwork quilt and little michael in astonishment which conquered terror raised his eyes to the superintendent's face while that worthy advocate of a master's virtue stood firmly striking his stout cane upon the ground with the air of a man ready to do battle with all the world in support of what he has asserted well then at any rate my business is done and ended said mr butchel moving off and i wish you joy mrs armstrong of your unaccountable good fortune come along jim said the baker to the respectable dealer in seized goods there's nothing to be done to-day that's clear but i hope you'll remember the twelve shillings as you promised me mrs armstrong i will indeed sir answered the widow earnestly and on receiving this assurance mr larkin took his departure with his professional friend leaving mr joseph parsons the widow armstrong and her son michael to carry on whatever conversation they might wish for without interruption well now if i ain't glad they're gone them fellows said the superintendent shutting the door after them you are a favoured woman mrs armstrong to get rid of em as you have done and i don't and won't question that you are thankful to those to whom thanks are due i always wish to be so sir said the widow well there's no hardship in that i suppose but about this son of yours this young master michael you must see to his doing his duty to his benefactor if he was to prove ungrateful mrs armstrong it is but fair to tell you that i wouldn't undertake to answer for the consequences god forbid he ever should be ungrateful to any as was kind to him replied the poor woman but indeed sir i don't think it is in his heart to be so since the day he was born god bless him i have had little besides love to give him and indeed sir i think the child would die for me michael slyly stole his little hand sideways under the bedclothes where it was soon clasped in that of his mother but his eyes were again firmly riveted upon the ground ay ay that's all very well but it has nothing to do in any way with his duty and obligations to sir matthew what i want to know is whether he is ready and willing to do that which sir matthew will require of him that's the main question you see mrs armstrong and what will that be sir said the widow while michael's eyes were again raised for a moment to the face of his taskmaster he is to be made a gentleman of that's to be the first work put upon him the poor woman smiled but little michael shook his head the superintendent appeared to pay no attention to either but again striking his cane magisterially upon the ground he added let him make up his mind to do all that he's bid and come back to dowling lodge with as little delay as possible with these words and without deigning to bestow any species of parting salutation upon those to whom they were addressed mr parsons left the room End of chapter four chapter five of the life and adventures of michael armstrong the factory boy this is a librivox recording chapter five a separation of loving hearts a specimen of finished composition condescension and generosity sir matthew close little michael with his own hands while the superintendent in his serpentine course homewards scattered the tidings of his master's munificence towards the factory boy michael armstrong and his mother indulged themselves in a few parting words and very tender caresses the mother continuing to repeat at intervals be sure darling to be a good boy and do what you're bid while the son reiterated his entreaties that she and teddy would take care one of t'other and have him back again spite of everything if they found that they could not do so well without him but even while this went on michael was improving his toilet by putting on the more carefully patched garments which had hitherto been kept sacred for sundays when this operation was completed and his hair face and hands made as clean as the joint efforts of himself and his mother could contrive to make them the little boy turned to leave the miserable shed that had been his home with a reluctant step and heavy heart retracing the short distance between his mother's bed and the door once and again to take another kiss and to repeat with increased earnestness the questions isn't there nothing more i can do for you mother before i go away and will you be sure to tell teddy to stop for me morning and night at the gate in the lane where it all happened will you mother but at length the lingering separation was completed 
and michael set off upon his return to dowling lodge in the meantime sir matthew himself had not been idle but retiring to his study he composed a paragraph for the county newspaper which after considerable study and repeated corrections was at length completed and dispatched by the post in a feigned hand the wax being stamped with the handle of the seal instead of his arms and the postage paid the paragraph ran thus english benevolence there is perhaps no class of men so cruelly misrepresented as the manufacturers of great britain surrounded on all sides by a population of labourers crowded together exactly in proportion to the quantity of work the neighbouring factories are able to furnish they are continually reproached both with giving too many hours of employment to their poor neighbours on the one hand and with the poverty which is the inevitable lot of operatives with large families on the other that all manufacturers however are not the cruel mercenary tyrants they are so often and so unjustly described to be was shown within the last few days by an incident which occurred near the town of ashley not a hundred miles from capital d blank l blank g capital l blank d blank e the owner of that splendid mansion while escorting the amiable lady blank blank round his grounds had occasion to remark some symptoms of a very noble disposition in one of the children belonging to a neighbouring factory on his estate on making inquiries he discovered him to be the son of a poor widow whose failing health made her and her orphan children peculiarly eligible as objects of charity this fact having been satisfactorily ascertained sir capital m dash t h dash w capital d dash l dash g gave way to the warm impulses of his generous heart and adopting the little orphan among his own children at once gratified the gentle feelings of his amiable nature and set them an example which it is impossible they should ever forget it is more easy for the recorder of this charming anecdote to relate thus the principal circumstances of it than to enter into any detail of the numberless delicate traits of character exhibited by sir capital m capital d dash l dash g in the course of the transaction those who know him thoroughly will however be at no loss how to supply these and those who do not would scarcely understand the description were it given with all the detail possible the value and the accuracy of the statements contained in this announcement belonged wholly to the author of it the phraseology to a private m s digest of newspaper eloquence the result of many years of steady research during which no morsel of fine writing that might assist in such occasional addresses to the public as the present had been ever suffered to flow down the stream of time and perish without having been first carefully noted in the night's repertory of fine periods having concluded this business sir matthew dowling rang his bell as it was only the study bell it was answered as usual by one of the housemaids where is the little boy my dear that i sent into the servants hall last night inquired sir matthew upon my word sir matthew i can't tell she replied adding in that tone of familiar confidence which her master's condescension encouraged but if you sent him into the hall sir matthew he never got there nor never will you may take my word for that as long as madame thompson reigns the housemaid was not a beauty none such as was before stated ever made part of lady dowling's household but she was a wit and sir matthew was too clever himself not to feel the value of cleverness in others he therefore raised his eyebrows in a comic grimace very good-humouredly chucked the maid under her ugly chin and instead of putting himself in a rage as might have happened under other circumstances he only said and how was that my dear come tell me all about it i like your stories peggy you're always so funny whose stories wouldn't be funny sir matthew if they told of the airs and graces of mother thompson replied the lively damsel she's for all the world like an old owl as sits winking his eyes and trying to look wise but she's a prime favourite with my lady peggy and into the bargain knows a thing or two about soups and hashes so we must be very respectful my dear in talking of her but as to her daring to say that the boy i ordered into the hall was to be turned out of it that's rather more than possible i think that's because you don't know mrs thompson sir matthew i only wish you had heard and seen em last night she and the butler and mrs fine airs my lady's maid and mr fine airs my lady's footman if it was not enough to make one sick i wish i may never see you again sir matthew they are a confounded impertinent set of rubbish replied sir matthew 
but still without losing his good humour however all people of fashion that is rich people peggy always do have a confounded impertinent set of servants about em that's one of the great differences between high people and low to be sure you must know best sir matthew replied the saucy grisette but with a look and accent somewhat ironical i don't mean to doubt that in the least i'm sure but in the places i've lived at lord wilmot's lord crampton's and such like i never did hear of my lord's commands being treated in that fashion they might have their jokes in the hall and the housekeeper's room too no doubt of it and impudent enough if you like it but for downright flat disobedience i never did hear of such a thing sir matthew on hearing this became rather white about the lips and red about the forehead but peggy knew the rising storm was not at all likely to fall on her so nothing daunted she went on i don't think i should have taken much notice of it sir matthew if it hadn't been for not liking to see you treated with disrespect for i'm not over and above partial to beggar children myself but that sort of natural dislike was nothing in comparison to my feelings about you sir and if i had been placed in power instead of having none your will would have been obeyed if every servant in the house had flowed at me for it you're an excellent girl peggy replied the knight approaching her very condescendingly you know well enough that you are a favourite and i know well enough my dear that you deserve to be so and i tell you what peggy i'll take care to let those animals my servants know that i am master here as well as in the factory and that my word is law and so it ought to be sir matthew replied the obedient domestic i hope i know my duty too well to dispute my master's will in anything and as she spoke she very meekly yielded herself to receiving the condescending salute with which sir matthew was pleased to reward her excellent sentiments you are an excellent good girl peggy he resumed after this little interruption and don't fear but i shall find means to reward you but you must give me your help my dear to confound the impertinence of these fellow-servants of yours if i don't make em wait upon that beggar's brat as if he was their lord and master never trust me with a kiss more where is the little factory vermin peggy i ain't able to answer you sir matthew all i know is that mrs thompson marched us all out of the kitchen where she sat in judgment on him last night and there he was left with the kitchen-maid and the fat cook but what's come of him since i am no ways able to say on hearing this sir matthew raised his hand towards the bell but suddenly recollecting himself he smiled and said no no that won't do peggy will it go my dear and ask where the boy is and then come back and tell me the damsel in return furtively smiled too in acquiescence and approval of his discretion and upon leaving his study for the purpose of prosecuting her inquiries among the servants she encountered the object of them as he entered the back door on his return from visiting his mother's cottage so here you are then well you must come along this minute to sir matthew said she addressing him somewhat gruffly and not too well pleased perhaps at this interruption to the confidential conversation with her master which it had been her purpose to renew but to the ears of michael the name of sir matthew was sufficient to render all other words indifferent and conscious only that into his dreaded presence he must go if commanded to do so he followed the girl with a beating heart and in a few minutes stood pale and almost breathless before the awful countenance of the great man sir matthew gazed at him for a moment with a sort of sneer which if interpreted skilfully would have been found to address itself inwardly sir matthew could not choose but sneer at the whimsical arrangements of accidents which had converted him into a mr allworthy the sneer however as far as it concerned himself had no mixture of contempt in it had another done this thing thought he should i not have called him fool and is it not ninety-nine chances to a hundred that thereby i should have described him truly may the same be said of me no by the living god it may not how now little boy you have made yourself smart i see vastly fine indeed an inch of clean dallas a piece of span new green baize for a patch a pair of bony legs without stockings and magnificent shoes i did not say a pair peggy but very magnificent shoes one i suppose one in a battle from a giant and the other from a dwarf fine as a prince isn't he peggy 
and he thus jeered the little fellow his eye wandered with malignant jocularity over his person which was in truth the very model of makeshift poverty while the child as he felt his eye palpably crawl like a reptile over him shuddered he knew not why then changing his tone so suddenly as to make even the confiding peggy start he continued you horrid lump of rag stand back stand back 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 behind that high chair d'ye hear stand close and stand still if he does not make me as sick as a dog peggy let me never smell musk more he does smell horrid bad to be sure sir matthew replied the girl hadn't i better take him back to molly the kitchen-maid and make her scour him no hang him that won't take it out of him i know em all no peggy let the scouring alone and just go upstairs to the nursery-maids and tell them to send me down a good handsome suit of clothes complete of master duodecimus's he is the nearest in size to this scaramouche and i will dress him peggy as if he were the son of a duke it will be fun capital fun and will it not be generous peggy generous sir matthew it will be past all belief what him to be dressed up in the clothes of master duodecimus oh my sir matthew you must surely be joking i'm as serious as an undertaker girl get along with you and do what i bid you the longer you're about it mind the longer i shall have to sit in the same room with the ragamuffin in his own full dress so make haste if you please this was said in the manner to remove all doubts as to the munificent knight's being in earnest and the active peggy went and returned with as little delay as was consistent with the necessity she felt herself under of entering into some short explanation with the nursery ladies one and all of whom seemed much inclined on the first opening of her mission to treat the whole business as a hoax when at length however she had succeeded in making it apparent that sir matthew was waiting for the suit of clothes in a most monstrous outrageous fashion of a hurry the messenger's arms were speedily loaded in exact conformity to the orders she had brought and she returned to the night's study with all that was needed to convert the rude exterior of little michael into the nearest resemblance that nature would permit to the elegant and accomplished master duodecimus considering the loathing and disgust manifested by sir matthew towards the person and the poverty of his protege it was extraordinary to see the amusement he seemed to derive from dressing him up though the alert and obedient peggy stood close by to do his pleasure it was his own large hands that thrust the little limbs of michael into the clothing he chose they should wear and it was amidst shouts of laughter from both that the ludicrous metamorphosis was completed but somehow or other when they had finished their masquerading work the result was not altogether what sir matthew anticipated the clothes were very handsome well-made clothes and as poor michael notwithstanding his leanness was a very handsome well-made boy the incongruity between them seemed to vanish in the most unaccountable manner as the operation drew towards a conclusion peggy however was not such a fool as not to understand what was expected of her so when the knight catching up his son's tasselled cap pressed it down upon the little curly head as a lusty packer of worthless goods thrust down the cover that is to enclose them and then pushed the child towards her with an impulse that nearly brought him upon his nose she very judiciously renewed her noisy laughter exclaiming did any one ever see such a little quiz quiz girl replied sir matthew eyeing him with no very fond expression it would be well for the scamp if that was the worst you could say of him i know a thing or two peggy and that boy will be lucky if he gets drowned i'll bet a hundred guineas that with a few lessons he would forge any writing you could show him and before he is twenty he will have taken as many shapes as turpin that boy was born with a halter round his neck i want no gypsy to tell me that during the whole of the undressing and redressing operations the boy's cheeks had been dyed with blushes and his eyes so fixedly nailed to the floor that neither sir matthew nor his maid had been able to enjoy their embarrassed expression but as this dark prophecy fell on him he looked up and it was well for him that his munificent patron at the same instant turned his mocking glances towards the servant as he said there gather up his rags girl and be sure you wash well after it for had he met that speaking young eye he could hardly have misunderstood the scorn that shot from it as it was however he saw nothing but the patched garments that were scattered round and once more sneering as he looked at them he added 
lead the little black guard through the servants hall and into mrs thompson's parlour do you hear peggy up to her very nose and tell her that i have sent him to pay her a visit and when she has had enough of the compliment lead him round to mademoiselle's room and we'll have a little fun among the children by no means displeased with an errand which permitted her to affront with impunity the autocrat of all the offices peggy gathered together michael's discarded wardrobe and then clutching hold of his hand led him bon gré malgré to the presence of the imperious housekeeper mrs willis my lady dowling's own maid and mr jennings my lady dowling's own man were enjoying with that important functionary a slight morning repast of fruit cakes and wine and at the moment peggy and her charge entered they were enjoying some very excellent jokes together but mr jennings no sooner cast his eye on the little factory boy than he arose looking rather abashed at being caught by a drawing-room guest of even nine years old with a glass of claret in one hand and a slice of pineapple in the other peggy to whom the conciliatory smiles of this gay gentleman did not descend enjoyed his mystification exceedingly and relaxing her rough hold of michael's wrist she led him respectfully towards the table saying my master has sent this young gentleman to pay you a visit mrs thompson perhaps you would like a little fruit there my dear that's the housekeeper sir matthew told you of and if you will please to go and sit down by her i dare say she will give you something nice mr jennings immediately placed a chair beside the gracious mrs thompson who after filling and setting before the young gentleman a plate with whatever she supposed would be most agreeable who is it peggy i didn't hear never a carriage before she could or at least before she would answer michael who had not accepted the chair offered to him took his cap from his head and with considerably more courage than he had yet shown said i am michael armstrong the factory boy who what screamed the housekeeper what bold joke is this mrs peggy perkins do you think you have got a patent for your place that you dare play such tricks as this if i keeps my place i don't think i shall have to thank you for it ma'am replied the favoured housemaid with very little civility my master ordered me to bring the boy to pay you a visit those was his very words mrs thompson and as i was bid so i have done there's some people as will do everything and anything they are bid observed mrs willis again drawing out her favourite smelling bottle while with the other hand she extended a wine-glass to mr jennings for a little madeira which she felt was absolutely necessary to support her in this very disagreeable emergency master or no master sir matthew dowling doesn't know how to behave himself it's i says it and i don't care who repeats it to him mr jennings stared at the factory boy for a full minute very attentively and then gave a long low whistle at the same time turning his eyes with a look of much intelligence full in the face of the housekeeper he isn't at all like any of em mrs thompson said he mrs thompson shook her head there is nothing at all in that mr jennings i'm sorry to say but remember i do desire and insist that the subject is never alluded to in my presence again when i lived with his grace i always made it a rule that none of the household should ever discourse in my presence of anything that it was not decent to hear well ma'am said peggy when you have done looking at him he is to go into Momsell's room for the children to see him the housekeeper the lady's maid and the footman all simultaneously lifted up their hands and eyes to heaven please to let me put on my old clothes and go home said michael you little ungrateful wretch explained peggy when sir matthew dressed you up himself with his own hands what do you mean by that you bad boy they'll laugh at me said michael resolutely and i don't like it you don't isn't that a good one said mr jennings clapping his hands in ecstasy oh lord pray let us have him back again mrs peggy that is to say if sir matthew can bear to part with him he's the finest fun i've got sight of this many a day you must find fun for yourself mr jennings for i shan't be at the trouble of bringing you none replied the self-satisfied peggy again seizing the hand of michael and leading him off well for a broom-maid i hope she's saucy enough said mr jennings but the subject of his remark was already beyond hearing threading her way through the long stone passages which conducted to the opposite wing of the mansion the whole of which was appropriated to the younger branches of the dowling family End of chapter five
chapter six of the life and adventures of michael armstrong the factory boy this is a librivox recording chapter six michael's introduction to all the miss dowlings sir matthew feeds him with his own hand and presents him to all his most valued friends having given a sharp rap on the door peggy was told to come in by the voice of mademoiselle bourgeois whereupon she threw the door wide open before her and stood with michael armstrong in her hand in the presence of three grown-up miss dowlings three middle-sized miss dowlings two little miss dowlings and their french governess the five youngest all rushed as by one accord towards michael what a pretty little boy was exclaimed by two or three of them are you come to play with us may we have a holiday mamselle what an elegant-looking creature exclaimed the eldest miss dowling who with her two grown-up sisters had come into the room for the advantage of practising duets on a venerable pianoforte totally out of tune and whose loudest note could by no means compete with the shrill accents of the animated group who inhabited the apartment did you ever see a prettier boy harriet who is he i wonder replied the young lady she addressed how he blushes said the governess tittering what's your name dear demanded miss martha the third daughter of the dowling race michael armstrong ma'am replied the boy looking up with an air of surprise for miss martha queer-looking as she was spoke kindly and queer-looking as she was michael met her eye with pleasure for that too spoke kindly though it was neither large nor bright martha dowling was in truth about as ugly as it was possible for a girl of seventeen to be who was neither deformed nor marked by the smallpox short fat snub-nosed red-faced with a quantity of sandy hair that if not red looked very much as if it intended to do so eyes of a light very light grey and without anything whatever in external appearance to recommend her except a smooth plump neck and shoulders with hands and arms to match which in truth were very fair and nice-looking and a set of well-formed stout white teeth what made the unlucky appearance of this young lady the more remarkable was the contrast it presented to the rest of her family all the other young people were like both their parents more than common tall for their respective ages and like most other tall young people rather thin so that lady dowling was apt to indulge herself by declaring that though certainly some of her children might be considered prettier than the rest there was not one of the whole set except that poor vulgar martha who was not most particular genteel looking genteel looking she certainly was not nor graceful nor beautiful in any way and the consequence was that father mother brothers and sisters were almost heartily ashamed of her this was a misfortune and she felt it to be so pretty sharply for poor vulgar martha was far from being a stupid girl but in her case as in a million of others it might be seen that adversity though like the toad ugly and venomous weareth a precious jewel in its head for of all her race she was the only one whose heart was not seared and hardened by the ceaseless operation of opulent self-indulgence she felt that she was rather an object of pity than of admiration of contempt than of envy of dislike than of love this is severe schooling for a young girl's heart but if it produce not reckless indifference or callous insensibility it often purifies softens and even elevates the character such were its effects on martha dowling that coarse seeming exterior contained the only spark of refinement of which the dowling family could boast never did a high-born hidalgo in spain's proudest days inculcate among his race the immeasurable importance of pure descent with more ceaseless or more sedulous earnestness than did sir matthew the omnipotence of wealth among his every child was taught as soon as its mind became capable of receiving the important truth that not only was it agreeable to enjoy and cherish all the good things which wealth can procure but that it was their bounden and special duty to make it visible before the eyes of all men that they could and that they did have more money spent upon them than any other family in the whole country but martha felt that all this could not apply to her strange to say the only tie resembling affection which prevented the total isolation of this poor girl among her family was that which existed between her hard-natured father and herself but it was a sentiment not easy to analyse in sir matthew it probably arose at first from his having been told that the little girl was very like him and on hers from his being the only person in the house who had ever bestowed a caress upon her 
in both cases cause and effect went on increasing martha's face saving its expression was incontrovertibly like her father's and for that reason or from the habit it had at first created her father though rather ashamed to confess it was certainly very fond of her that as a child she should love him in return was almost inevitable but that as she advanced in years she should feel for the being the most completely formed by nature to be hateful to her an affection the most unchanging and devoted had something of mystery in it less easy to be explained yet so it was martha dowling adored her hard-hearted vicious unprincipled illiterate vulgar father as heartily as if he had been the model of everything she most admired and approved nay it may be that she loved him better or at any rate more strongly still for it was rather with fanaticism than devotion or like the pitying fondness with which a mother dotes on a deformed child who sees only that because it is less lovable it has more need of love than the rest it was not however on the same principle that sir matthew's affection for his ugly daughter increased as years rolled on for he saw that though as a child she had been like him she was now grown very plain and in company he felt almost as much ashamed of her as lady dowling herself but he could not mistake her love and true affection nor resist the charm of feeling that at least there was one being in existence who would have cherished him even if he had not been the great man he was in private he scrupled not to yield to this feeling and certainly derived considerable pleasure from it but before witnesses he always joined in the family tone respecting poor martha and scrupled not to push her on one side upon all occasions on which any display of dowling elegance was contemplated it was this ugly martha dowling who now startled little michael with her voice of kindness and notwithstanding all her lady mother said about the horrid vulgarity of her manners poor martha had a sweet and gentle voice the child looked up at her and with the weakness that appeared constitutionally peculiar to him his eyes were immediately filled with tears yet michael was not a whimpering boy either many had seen him harshly treated for he had worked almost from babyhood in the cotton factory but nobody had ever seen him cry under it but if his mother or his poor sickly brother touched his little heart either with joy or tenderness he would weep and laugh both with very infantine susceptibility so it was with him now for when martha added with a good-humoured smile and what brings you here master armstrong he laughed outright as he replied indeed ma'am i ain't master armstrong and i don't know a bit what i be here for this speech though addressed to martha being heard by all the contrast between his appearance and his language considerably excited the curiosity of the two eldest miss dowlings la how he talks i thought he was a gentleman by his jacket didn't you arabella said miss harriet yes to be sure i did replied the eldest sister but i am sure he is not with that horrid way of speaking what did you bring him here for peggy continued the young lady with an air of authority because master bid me miss was the satisfactory reply well to be sure that is queer i suppose he's the son of somebody or other or papa would never have sent him in to us it is not at all his way to patronize vulgarity where do you live young gentleman michael looked very much as if he were in danger of laughing again but he did not and replied very demurely in mr sykes back kitchen ma'am in hoxley lane though the answer was addressed to the inquirer his eye turned to martha as he uttered it as if anxious to see how she bore it but he encountered a look that altogether puzzled him for though it was at least as kind as before there was uneasiness in it and she looked round her as if uncomfortable doubtful of what would happen next she did not however wait long for the result for miss sophia miss louisa and miss charlotte the three middling-sized miss dowlings who had approached very near to the little boy and were even growing so familiar that miss charlotte had taken hold of one of his dark curls were severely and suddenly drawn off by the respective hands of their two eldest sisters and the governess then he is not a young gentleman after all said miss sophia la how funny exclaimed miss louisa where did he get his clothes from interrogated miss harriet most likely he stole them responded miss arabella why tis duodecimus jacket ejaculated the observing miss charlotte oh quelle horreur cried the governess driving her pupils all before her to the other end of the room 
at this moment and before any more active measures could be resorted to for the safety of the young ladies the door of the schoolroom was again thrown open and the portly person of sir matthew appeared at it accompanied by the globe-like figure of dr crockley good morning young ladies said the proud father looking round him and immediately entering into the jest that he saw was afloat how do you like the young beau i have sent you good gracious papa exclaimed the elegant and much admired miss arabella he is a beggar boy and a thief sir matthew and his friend dr crockley both burst into such a shout of laughter at this sally that it was a minute before either of them could speak but at length the knight turning to the doctor said leave my girls alone crockley for finding out what's what i don't believe there's one of them that would have found that fellow out if i had wrapped him up in the king's own mantle they are sharp enough there is no doubt of that replied his friend but i must say you don't perform your charitable acts by halves sir matthew you have dressed up the little scamp so superbly that nothing but the vulgar dark complexion could make one know that he was not one of your own why yes there is some difference in the skins i must say replied sir matthew looking with most parental complacency on the fair skins flaxen hair and light eyelashes of his race difference indeed tis africa and europe and is it not remarkable sir matthew to see the look of him hasn't he got a sort of slavish terrified air with it i tell you what sir matthew i should not be at all surprised to find when the march of philosophy has got a little farther that the blackamoor look comes along with the condition and that the influence of wealth and consequence is as quickly shown upon the external appearance of men women and children as a field of clover upon the inferior animals and why not it is quite natural perfectly conformable to the analogy that by accurately tracing cause and effect may be followed through all creation you have a head sir matthew for that sort of thing you can understand me if nobody else can the little doctor knew that this was one of the soft points at which his wealthy neighbour was assailable sir matthew loved to be assured that his head was of a superior fabric but why papa should you send a nasty beggar boy to us with duo's clothes on inquired the intelligent louisa before he replied to this the knight exchanged a glance with his friend which seemed to say that's the right sort she's in the clover field i have taken him in for charity my dear replied the knight with a sort of pomposity that seemed of a new pattern the young ladies had never seen papa look so before martha from having found herself rather more frequently the object of dr crockley's jokes than she desired had on his entering the room retired to the window but now she came up to her father and quietly as often happened almost unnoticed kissed his hand for charity exclaimed the fair-haired arabella moving a step or two farther away from the object of this extraordinary caprice la papa why don't you send him to the hospital dr crockley laughed outrageously that girl sir matthew he said when he had recovered his voice that girl is beyond all comparison the most thoroughly born lady that ever i happened to hit upon and that is saying something i promise you she hasn't a commonplace vulgar notion in her from top to toe it is what i call the physiology of wealth it is upon my soul it is a study a science i have not got to the end of it but i am certain i shall make a system out of it and you'll be able to follow me there's some comfort in that i declare to god that if i had not found you in the neighbourhood i should have bolted i cannot exist without occasionally bringing my mind in contact with superior intellect you find that too sir matthew i'm sure you do sir matthew assured him that he did very much and then pulling a belinda lock that adorned the olive-coloured throat of mademoiselle bourgeois he asked her if she had ever seen a brat taken in for charity so nicely dressed as that little blackguard brat ça veut dire petit vous rien no my honour sir matthew never you are without no revel de most whilst the french governess struggled to find a word sufficiently expressive of her admiration and if possible with some little meaning besides sir matthew took the liberty of pinching her ear while he whispered into it what you little rogue what she gave him a parisian ayad by no means an unkind one and turned away while the two smallest miss dowlings ran up to her and in the jargon in which their mamma and papa delighted demanded si papa voulait let them jouer avec the little beggar boy 
this question repeated nearly in the same words by mademoiselle bourgeois to the knight appeared to cause him some perplexity and after reflecting upon it for a minute he turned to consult his philosophical friend i say crockley what do you think of that then lowering his voice he added you comprehend the job doctor which will do the best to help it parlour or kitchen schoolroom or factory drawing-room or scullery all and every of them replied his friend in the same low tone but very decisively no doubt in nature about that sir matthew he must be here there and everywhere and the thing will fly like mad you are always right crockley there is nobody like you replied the grateful knight cordially slapping the round shoulders of his friend i twig i twig and so it shall be by the lord harry you are as rapid as lightning sir matthew i remember no instance of a cerebral formation so absolutely perfect as yours now then let us visit my lady shall we i am as dry as a brick dust and it is about lunch-time i take it bring the boy with you and introduce him before the servants in style so i will that's it i twig crockley go martha and see if the luncheon is laid the report being favourable to the wishes of the gentlemen the party consisting of the three eldest miss dowlings their papa and the doctor left the young ladies and their governess to dine while with little michael who was ordered to follow they all repaired to the dining-room where a well-covered table awaited them her ladyship and mr augustus were already there and both expressed exactly the degree of curiosity which the knight desired as to who the little gentleman might be whom they brought with them miss dowling and miss harriet dowling burst into a loud laugh sir matthew looked towards the sideboard and seeing two servants in attendance there spoke as follows my dear lady dowling i must bespeak your munificent charity and universal benevolence in favour of this little unhappy boy his mother is a widow and and something i forget exactly what is very unhappy about her and this little boy behaved remarkably well here sir matthew broke off in some degree of embarrassment not wishing particularly to impress upon his lady's mind that it was his tender care for the lady clarissa shrimpton which had first introduced the fortunate factory boy to his notice but he passed over all that very skilfully and ended his harangue by saying i know perfectly well my dear lady dowling that there is not in the whole world so amiable a person as yourself and therefore i entertain not the slightest doubt that the benevolence which warms my heart on this occasion will communicate itself to yours lady dowling raised her light eyebrows and her still lighter eyelashes into a look of the most unmitigated astonishment and remained thus for a while contemplating the extraordinary spectacle of one of the handsomest boys she had ever seen dressed in a style of unquestionable fashion and presented to her as a being so deplorably miserable as to have excited the pity of her husband the first clear and distinct idea that suggested itself was the necessity of inquiring respecting this beautiful child's mother and of finding out whether she might not happen to be beautiful too the next arose from the sudden recognition of her own son's own clothes and the complexion of the lady became extremely florid i should like to know where he got those clothes from she said in accents that by no means spoke composure of spirit my dearest love replied the most amiable and the most polite of husbands that is entirely my doing you have known me long enough my sweetest to be aware that i never do anything by halves i saw that little fellow ragged and wretched and i clothed him well i must say i do think began her ladyship when sir matthew seating himself at the table thrust a knife and fork into the very centre of a pigeon pie and accompanied the act by a sound something between a slight cough and a grunt which in language matrimonial was known to mean you had better hold your tongue and mind your business whereupon lady dowling sat down too but her fair complexion was rather more rosy than was becoming and it was in no very sweet voice that she said to martha who ventured to take a chair next to her do get a little farther child can't you you know i hate to be crushed and crammed up so here dr crockley who had already fallen with vehemence upon a cold ham stopped for a moment and laughed vehemently my dear madam you are of the slight and elegant order yourself and you don't make allowance for poor people who are as fat and round about as miss martha and i we can't squeeze ourselves into an eggshell miss martha can we 
her slim sisters tittered and the witty augustus observed that to be sure martha did not look more like a collar of oxford brawn than anything else in creation meanwhile the meal proceeded and little michael continued to stand half-way between the door and the table as fixedly as if he had taken root there martha was in general very philosophically inclined to let all things round her take their course but she sat exactly opposite to the object of her father's benevolence and there was something in the expression of his eye as it rested upon the dainties before him that was more than she could bear may i give the little boy something to eat papa said she addressing her father in a timid voice how shall we manage about that crockley whispered sir matthew into the ear of the doctor who sat close to him cram him cram him sir matthew you'll find it like oil on the surface of water spreading far and wide replied his counsellor whispering in return let the boy have to boast of his high feeding and it will do more good than if you were to endow him with lands and houses and keep him lean say you so my wise man faith then the matter is easy enough for i believe dowling lodge is rather celebrated for its superfluity of good cheer we'll have him gasping with indigestion within a week see if we don't then raising his voice he answered the petition of martha by repeating her words may you give the little boy something to eat and then added with a laugh by all manner of means miss martha and taking some half-demolished fragments off his own plate he may boast of feeding as well as his master here master factory catch and so saying the benevolent owner of dowling lodge skilfully cut the air with half a pigeon which taking exactly the direction he intended struck michael in the middle of the forehead whatever might be the effect of this liberality of heart and hand out of doors sir matthew had every reason to be satisfied with the result within the whole dowling family with the exception of stupid martha burst into a simultaneous shout of delight while dr crockley clapped his hands and vociferated bravo as loud as he could scream just at this moment the great bell at the front door and it was a very great bell resounded along passage and halls with prodigious clamour this is a sound which produces in those who hear it emotions varying according to their varying temperaments genuinely fine poco curante people if they hear it heed it not fussy folks of whatever rank or station prepare their looks and their books themselves and their belongings to receive the threatened visitation advantageously but in a mansion of such professional display as dowling lodge a ring at the door-bell is an event of serious importance in such an establishment the luxuries or even the comforts of the family are confessedly of no importance at all when placed in competition with the display of their grandeur and upon the present occasion the whole family hastened to leave their unfinished repast in order to receive the welcome spectator of their fine clothes and fine furniture in the drawing-room my lady dowling and her two light-coloured elder daughters sir matthew his eldest son and his learned friend succeeded in reaching their respective sofas and bergeres half a minute before the door was thrown open and lady clarissa shrimpton miss brotherton miss mogg and mr osmond norval were announced great of course and very zealous was the joy expressed by the dowling family at the sight of their illustrious friend and her cortege miss brotherton was indeed of herself or rather of her purse a personage pretty sure of being well received everywhere but even miss mogg was in yankee phrase well shaken and mr osmond norval gazed at by the young ladies as an emanation from the rays that encircle the brow of apollo while even the exquisite augustus ventured in compliment to his titled patroness to shake him too though he had never been introduced to him at oxford but the feelings of sir matthew at this prompt reappearance of his fair and noble friend were something vastly different from anything his family could participate in nor did lady clarissa mistake them there was a look that spoke infinitely more than any tongue could utter and a meaning in the silent pressure of the hand confirming the idea which had often recurred to her during the night that it would soon be necessary to make sir matthew understand the exact nature and extent of the flattering but perfectly innocent preference she was conscious of feeling for him this first delightful but somewhat agitating moment over lady clarissa hastened to explain the purpose of her visit you guess why i am come do you not sir matthew she said pointing to mr osmond norval permit me to present to you and your highly educated family this young votary of the muses who if my judgment errs not may fairly claim competition with the first poets of the age 
nor should we of this remote neighbourhood be insensible to the honour of being the first to assist in pluming the yet unfledged wing which shall one day bear him aloft in the empyrean regions of eternal fame nothing could be more touching than the manner in which mr osmond norval pressed his hat between his two hands and bowed low 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 to the noble lady who thus announced him sir matthew with a stride which for the vigorous distance it carried him might have been compared to that of the knave of hearts approached the young man and strenuously pressing one of his slender hands in both his own capacious fists attested the value he attached to her ladyship's introduction by saying mr osmond norval i will not deny that i do occasionally myself offer tribute at the muse's shrine and that being in some sort a brother of the craft i most unfeignedly rejoice in making the acquaintance of a gentleman so distinguished in it as yourself but that is not the feeling sir which principally leads me to tell you that from this time forth i shall hold you as one of my most esteemed friends you understand me that lady sir pointing to lady clarissa is a person whose lightest word ought to be law in this neighbourhood and to me is so if you publish any works put sir matthew dowling's name down sir for fifty copies should you find yourself at any time in want of a library pray remember that there is one of no very small limits at dowling lodge and your reception sir in my drawing-room and at my dinner-table will ever be such as befits me to bestow on one honoured by the patronage of lady clarissa shrimpton before this speech was quite finished lady dowling becoming rather fidgety ventured to mutter something about its being far better to sit down to talk but miss brotherton was greatly too much amused by what was passing to hear her and for miss mogg to sit while her patroness stood was quite out of the question so that lady dowling and the two eldest miss dowlings continued to stand like three finely dressed flaxen-headed statues to the end of it sir matthew then led the high-born lady to a chair while miss brotherton perceiving that her conversation with the knight was now reduced to a whisper and that consequently there would be no more fun in listening to it condescended at last to answer a few of the amiable inquiries about her health which were addressed to her by mr augustus and his two sisters meanwhile the young norval with pensive eye intent on nature's beauties stole his way to the open window and there having twice or thrice passed his fingers through his long locks which descended in disordered curls almost to his shoulders and once and again buttoned and unbuttoned the broad shirt collar which fell back unrestrained by that most unintellectual ligature a cravat remained partly it might be to let the young ladies look at him and partly to receive the fragrant breeze of summer upon his brow it was now that dr crockley felt he was called upon to do something that might bring him into notice and waddling up to the young poet he addressed him with an air of incipient friendship which seemed to say and i too am somebody you will find this neighbourhood not very prolific young gentleman in such gifts of intellect as a poet requires in order to be duly appreciated nevertheless i will not deny that there is amongst us a knot a little knot mr norval whom upon further acquaintance you may find not altogether uncongenial for myself i may venture to say that i am as warmly devoted to every subject directly or indirectly connected with the divine ethereal immaterial intellectual part of our composite formation as it is possible for a man to be and it will give me pleasure sir to make your acquaintance as this was spoken with energy the sultry season made itself felt under the exertion and dr crockley found it necessary so far to remember the viler portion of his composite formation as to wipe his face and bald head assiduously the poet bowed but not as he had bowed to lady clarissa meanwhile lady dowling her light-coloured daughters and miss mogg sat profoundly silent upon two chairs and one sofa of the splendid apartment miss brotherton and mr augustus continued to talk about nothing and sir matthew and lady clarissa ceased not to mutter what none but themselves could hear upon an ottoman which stood in front of a distant window if eye-beams could have interrupted a tete-a-tete -tete, theirs would not have long continued to proceed undisturbed for the mistress of dowling lodge did certainly cast not a few anxious glances towards the master of it but it was not for that reason that he at length got up and rather hastily left the room while all this was passing in the drawing-room martha dowling and michael armstrong remained alone together in the dining-room the flying pigeon impelled by the beneficent sir matthew having hit the forehead of his highly favoured protege at the very moment that the larum announcing lady clarissa's arrival made itself heard 
the greatly amused company left the room before it was possible to ascertain what would become of it the child caught it ere it came to the ground but having done so held it by one leg with an air of very comical indecision till dr crockley who respectfully walked the last out of the room shut the door behind him the eyes of the factory boy and the ugly girl then met come to the table my dear said martha and if you like that bird eat it here is a plate and knife and fork for you but if you like anything else better leave it and tell me what you will have michael opened his magnificent black eyes and looked earnestly at her he approached the table laid down the half dissected pigeon but said not a word you would like something else better would you not said martha smiling at him i don't know answered michael returning the smile you don't know cannot you tell what you should like no ma'am if you please i don't know what any of it is my dear child it is all very good i believe only you know some people like one thing and some another little boys generally like something very sweet here is some cake what do you say to that i know what i should like best said michael do you then you shall have it if you will tell me what it is something good for mother said the child blushing violently but you must send me and order me to take it to her or else it will be stealing it very well i will send something to her but you must eat something yourself first what shall it be michael this arrangement seemed to put the boy into a state of perfect ecstasy he clapped his hands raised one foot and then the other with childish glee and exclaimed in an accent from which all timidity had fled oh dear oh dear how nice what the cake or the grapes or what taking it to mother taking it to mother cried michael then you love mother very much michael said martha drawing the child towards her and kissing his smooth dark forehead michael nodded his head and nestled closer to her well then never mind about the cake at present but i must find a little basket must i not i will give you a basket if you will take care of it and bring it back to me because perhaps we may want it again there you may eat that if you are hungry while i am gone away i shall be back again in a minute so saying she placed some bread and meat before him and left the room michael had by no means lost his appetite by his morning walk to oxley lane and being in excellent spirits to boot he sat down and began to devour what had been set before him with very zealous eagerness he had not however done one half of what he was capable of performing when another door opposite to the one by which martha had made her exit opened and sir matthew dowling walked in michael's knife and active fingers remained suspended midway between his mouth and the plate the colour forsook his cheek and his eyes sunk as if unable to meet that of his munificent patron what stuffing still you greedy little rascal what have you touched with your nasty factory fingers not the grapes i hope michael tried to say no but did not succeed in producing the sound so contented himself by letting the forefinger of his left hand drop into his plate to show how he had been engaged don't look so like a fool you oaf said sir matthew taking him by the shoulder and shaking him with some vivacity you are to come along with me do you hear that and see a lot of fine folks and to look up at them too do you hear and by g blank d if you blubber or look grumpish i'll have you strapped ten times over worse than you ever saw done at the factory come along and mind what i have promised for i'll keep it and worse that you may rely michael behaved like a little hero he remembered the promised basket and the voice that had told him he should have it he remembered hoxley lane too and his mother and teddy and their morsel of dry bread so he walked manfully along beside sir matthew and when they reached the drawing-room door and his benefactor stretched forth a hand to take his he yielded it to him with scarcely any perceptible shudder sir matthew walked some steps forward with the boy in his hand into the drawing-room and then standing quite still pointed to the child and said lady clarissa behold the factory boy nothing could be more skilful than this form of presentation for it told lady clarissa everything and lady dowling nothing lady clarissa sprung from her seat and ran towards the child is it possible she exclaimed with every appearance of violent emotion oh sir matthew these last words were audible only to the knight and the little boy 
but as the latter could make nothing of them and the former almost anything he pleased it was evident that the lady was as well skilled in saying more than met the ear as the gentleman indeed indeed said lady clarissa drawing forth another of the coroneted handkerchiefs indeed indeed this is a noble act sir matthew here her ladyship pressed her handkerchief to her eyes and remained in the eloquent silence of that position for a moment then raising herself from the softness that as she hinted to sir matthew in a whisper she felt stealing upon her she called to mr osmond norval and said in a tone audible to all present osmond norval favoured of heaven and the muse let not this beautiful subject escape you look at this pretty boy look at the delicate air of aristocratic refinement which pervades his person osmond the earth has not made her daily circuit round the sun since i beheld this child the very type of sordid wretchedness would you know the hand that wrought this wondrous change would you learn what heart suggested it behold them here and lady clarissa laid her noble fingers on the coat-sleeve of sir matthew dowling her ladyship does sir matthew dowling no more than justice mr norval said dr crockley approaching the group this is an act that ought to be given to fame and if sir matthew himself does not object to it i would suggest its being recorded by your pen in such a form as may give it general circulation the poet pressed his hand upon his heart and bowed profoundly and then raising the other hand to his forehead he stood for some time silently meditating on the theme thus offered to him during this interval the different groups which surrounded him formed a most charming picture the young man himself stood apart and unconsciously perhaps became the centre to which every eye-beam converged lady clarissa and sir matthew side by side and at no great distance from him awaited his reply her ladyship with an affectionate smile on her lip that spoke at once her confidence in his power and will to do what she required of him sir matthew's expression of countenance could not be read so plainly it was grave but it might be doubtful whether its gravity proceeded from displeasure that the answer should be delayed or solely from the deep interest the subject possessed for him lady dowling with her hands crossed before her was seated on a sofa exactly in front of them with her light eyes rather more widely open than usual looking straight forward and her small features seeming to indicate that she was not in the sweetest humour in the world dr crockley his hands in his waistcoat pockets and his short legs rather widely extended in what dancing matters term the second position swayed himself with nice balance to and fro as if measuring the interval of suspense by seconds vibrated by his person miss arabella dowling and miss harriet dowling sat close together upon an ottoman like to a double cherry of the bigarro kind with their four eyes so fixed upon the poet that it seemed as if they had put but one heart and one soul between them and on this subject at least their hearts and souls if not one were the same for they had both and at the very same instant fallen violently in love with mr osmond norval in a deep armchair in which she had almost buried herself sat or rather lay little miss brotherton almost convulsed with laughter and with her pocket-handkerchief by no means elegantly applied to her mouth being nearly half of it within in the hope of stifling at least the sound of her mirth while mr augustus leant in an attitude of very distinguished elegance on the back of her chair a little behind her appeared miss mogg who was in truth neither sitting nor standing but perched very insecurely on the extreme edge of a couch which uncomfortable attitude she had chosen from not feeling quite certain whether she ought to stand like lady clarissa or sit like miss brotherton the first she feared was too dignified and distinguished for her the last too comfortable and she deserved credit for hitting upon a position so far removed from either and lastly very near the door by which he had entered and to which he had sunk back he knew not how stood michael this picturesque state of things having lasted quite long enough osmond norval raised his eyes from the ground to the face of lady clarissa and making a sudden step forwards dropped on one knee and seized her hand he attempted to speak but for some time his voice appeared perfectly choked by emotion at last however he recovered the power of articulation and said such a subject oh heaven at your bidding too best and dearest lady clarissa can you doubt that all my power and strength will be put in requisition for it but may i ask is it to be published by subscription 
without immediately replying to this interesting and to mr osmond norval most important inquiry lady clarissa suddenly clapped her hands together with a sort of vehement enthusiasm that looked very like delirium even sir matthew though his intimacy with her had more than once made him the witness to some extraordinary freaks looked at her with astonishment lady dowling's eyes were more widely open than ever miss mogg instinctively thrust her hand into her bag in search of a smelling bottle and miss brotherton took her handkerchief out of her mouth and looked grave i have got it oh i have got it she exclaimed what a delicious idea let us sit down mogg push forward that couch child poor girl she really is almost too fat to move gracious heaven sir matthew what would become of my etherealized spirit if it were so encumbered but sit down sit down all of you norval place yourself on that tabouret mary brotherton draw near and listen and all the rest of you give ear to what i am going to say and answer the questions i shall ask with freedom and sincerity thus conjured every one in the room except lady dowling who stirred not an inch drew round the place where lady clarissa had seated herself and prepared with considerable curiosity to hear what she was going to say is not amusement the very soul of life she began no doubt of it my lady from the lips of dr crockley was the most articulate of the many acquiescent answers which followed is not a country neighbourhood fearfully lamentably deficient in this pursued the animated inquirer there cannot be two opinions on that point replied sir matthew with authority and is it not the duty of neighbours residing within reach of each other as we do to exert every facility with which nature has endowed them in order as much as possible to soften to each other the privations to which their distance from the metropolis obliges them to submit in reply to this demand there was a perfect clamour of approbation well then continued lady clarissa if such be your feelings i am certain of success in the project that has come like a spirit of light borne upon silver wings to visit my dull spirit this noble act of sir matthew's must not pass away like an ordinary deed that is hardly performed ere it be forgotten no it shall live in story it shall live in song it shall live again in action Norval dear gifted friend did you ever write a drama occasionally a scene or two lady clarissa that is enough dear osmond i ask not a hackneyed worn-out pen i will relate to him sir matthew this interesting anecdote exactly as it occurred he shall dramatize it perhaps introduce an episode or underplot to increase the business of the scene we will all act it and here lady clarissa gracefully bowed to the whole party and all the neighbourhood shall be assembled to enjoy the fete what say you to this sir matthew upon my word my lady i think it is one of the cleverest and most agreeable ideas that ever entered a lady's head if you and mr norval will arrange the drama lady clarissa i will take care to have one of the rooms fitted up as a theatre and depend upon it we shall be in no want of actors upon my word i never liked an idea so much in my life will it not be pleasant mary brotherton said lady clarissa in her most caressing tone to the heiress very pleasant indeed replied the young lady i should ask no better fun and what does my lady dowling say resumed lady clarissa with that stiffness of manner which with her ladyship now and then refreshed the memory of her plebeian friends as to the difference of rank between them oh dear me i am sure i don't know replied lady dowling looking frightened well we must not torment lady dowling by forcing her to act sir matthew there cannot be a doubt that we shall have volunteers in abundance you will act mary brotherton will you not act most assuredly i will act lady clarissa replied the heiress people as much at liberty to please themselves as i am seldom refuse to aid and abet a scheme so exceedingly full of amusement as this seems to be we will set such an example cried dr crockley rubbing his hands joyously that every county in england shall hear of us with envy i know what sir matthew can make of a thing if he takes to it leave him alone for giving the go-by to all the world right away young gentlemen right away depend upon it you'll have a theatre and actors too that will do you justice 
at this interesting moment just as the fair-haired miss dowlings began to whisper to each other something about characters and dresses and mr augustus to whisper to miss brotherton his hope that he should have to act a great deal with her the great bell sent forth another peal upon which lady clarissa held up her finger in a token of silence and before the new visitor entered all the bright sallies of the party were as effectually extinguished as if they had been supplied by gas which was suddenly turned off End of chapter six chapter seven of the life and adventures of michael armstrong the factory boy this is a librivox recording chapter seven a popular character more benevolence interesting intelligence received with becoming animation a select committee a farewell full of meaning the person who produced this very powerful effect was a lady not particularly distinguished either by wealth or station but she seemed to possess the faculty of finding her way into every house within her reach whether the owner of it desired her presence or not mrs gabberly was the widow of a clergyman who had formerly been vicar of the parish of st mary's ashley and having made herself the very largest acquaintance that ever was enjoyed by any country lady without a carriage she determined upon continuing amongst them after her husband died as it might have taken her she said more years than she was likely to live before she could expect to make so many friends all over again she therefore on leaving the vicarage contented herself with a very small house as near the town as possible and went on very much as she had done before only having one maid-servant instead of two and contenting herself with a donkey-chair and a very little boy to drive it instead of a one-horse chaise and a steady man-servant of all work considering the wealth and splendour of the neighbourhood in which accident had first placed her and to which choice now held her bound it may be looked upon as a matter of wonder that she should have made any intimacies at all but though the vicarage of st mary's ashley was far enough from being richly endowed and the private fortune of the late incumbent not such as to enable him to approach to anything like an equality in his style of living to even the least wealthy among the manufacturers in the district there is still a species of respect for the profession of a clergyman which opens to him and his family the houses of many greatly their superiors in point of wealth and it therefore pretty generally depends on the clergy themselves whether they are on intimate terms with their neighbours or not now mr gabberly or more properly speaking mrs gabberly who in strength of will had ever been his far better half did greatly desire to be on intimate terms with her neighbours rich or poor gentle or simple old or young she was determined to be intimate with them all and she was intimate with them all very intimate one word more and mrs gabberly shall be left to speak for herself which she was certainly able to do with as little impediment of any kind as most people mrs gabberly was the daughter of a physician and from her earliest years had acquired so decided a taste for the theory and practice of medicine that she could never wean herself entirely from it but was thought by many to let it still occupy rather too large a share of her conversation and thoughts nevertheless mrs gabberly was exceedingly popular for though her discourse ran much upon bruises and bowels rickets and rooms spasms and spines it ran also upon matters more attractive if she could not tell what everybody for three miles round had for dinner on the very day on which she was speaking it was a hundred to one but she could tell within a cutlet or a hash what they had been all eating for a week before she knew with an approach to correctness that was perfectly astonishing the amount of everybody's expenditure and everybody's debts could tell to the fraction of a new ribbon how many bonnets each lady consumed per annum and was perfectly au fait of the quantity of corn and hay got through in everybody's stables no flirtation ever escaped either her eyes or her tongue and the morning post was a less faithful record of fine parties than the tablets of her comprehensive memory the dowling family was aware of all this and each in their way had a peculiar value for her society for mrs gabberly knew how to be all things to all men women and children but at the present moment it was sir matthew who felt the most decided movement of satisfaction at beholding her sharp black eyes brisk step and eager manner of reconnoitring every individual present as she entered the room here is my general advertiser thought the knight as he extended his huge hand to welcome her we will have a theatrical representation that shall immortalize my charity 
and here is the one that shall act the part of fame and trumpet it round the country my goodness what a charming party of you has got all together this morning exclaimed mrs gabberly smiling and bowing and nodding and curtsying to everybody in succession all the time that sir matthew continued his cordial handshaking now you must just tell me what you are all about for if you don't i shall die and there's the truth no no mrs gabberly you shan't die if we can save your life replied sir matthew in his most jovial tone we are a gay and happy party at this moment i do believe one and all and here the knight thought proper to send a glance after little michael who notwithstanding his fine clothes was looking pale and sad enough in the most distant corner from the principal group to which he had been able to creep the experienced eye of sir matthew read past suffering and present terror in his speaking features and he cursed the trembling child in his heart of hearts but sir matthew dowling might have removed as many coatings as the grave digger in hamlet ere the looker-on could have penetrated so far and it must have been a quick observer that could have detected the sort of lurid glare that for half an instant gleamed in the savage look he cast upon the boy it was for no longer space that his joyous gaiety was obscured and he then turned again his admiring glances upon the lady clarissa and resumed his speech this is the person mrs gabberly you must let into the mystery you must entreat her ladyship to be pleased to inform you what it is she's going to make us all do well then i hope her ladyship won't refuse you won't be so cruel will you my lady no certainly replied lady clarissa smiling complacently on the knight if sir matthew complies with my proposal i shall have no objection to its being proclaimed to all the world and here glances were exchanged between the knight and the lady perfectly intelligible to each other and which said very distinctly ah lady clarissa on the one part and oh sir matthew on the other speak then my lady said the gallant manufacturer with a low bow and whatever you shall say shall be law now then ladies and gentlemen all of you give ear for not mrs gabberly alone but every one present should pay attention to what i am about to say and here lady clarissa turned her eyes round about her in search of the hero of the scene where is the little boy said she in a tone of great theatrical feeling come here my dear little fellow said sir matthew again turning his glances towards michael and now looking amiable and benignant with all his might but the child seemed to wither beneath this sunshine even more conspicuously than when he had been left in the shade and it was not till the knight made some gigantic strides forwards to meet him that poor michael formed the desperate courage necessary to bring him from his corner to the spot where his noble benefactress stood nay the last steps were not made without the helping hand of sir matthew which heavily laid upon his shoulder performed a twofold office ostensibly caressing while in truth it forcibly impelled the little trembler forward now then mrs gabberly said lady clarissa look at this interesting little fellow it is he who is the hero of our fete indeed and pray what may the young gentleman's name be said mrs gabberly is not that delicious cried lady clarissa oh sir matthew how i envy you your feelings note that dear norval the touch is exquisitely dramatic and must on no account be omitted this young gentleman mrs gabberly continued lady clarissa with increasing animation this young gentleman as you most naturally call him was a few short hours ago a wretched ragged beggar boy sir matthew dowling from motives that i dare not wound his generous heart by thus publicly dwelling upon has rescued him from poverty and destruction this deed so beautiful in itself and so beneficial in its influence as an example is about to be immortalized as it ought to be by the pen the rapid brilliant touching pen of my young friend mr osmond norval he has undertaken to dramatize this charming trait of benevolence and our excellent sir matthew has consented to fit up a little theatre for the representation of it at which all the neighbourhood are to be present as invited guests well now if ever i heard anything so delightful as that exclaimed mrs gabberly clapping her hands in ecstasy are the cards sent out sir matthew not yet mrs gabberly replied the knight with his most friendly smile but depend upon it when they are you will not be forgotten 
well now my dear lady dowling i am sure you are always so kind to me cried the delighted mrs gabberly making her way towards the sofa where sat the lady of the mansion in frowning state i should not wonder if you were to contrive a bed for me on this great occasion it would be just like you and oh my i have got such a quantity of things i want to tell you but i can't stop one instant longer now if you'd give me the whole world so good-bye to you all my dears i've heard something about you miss arabella but it must keep my dear and i've a secret for miss harriet's ear too when we have got leisure but good-bye good-bye good morning my lady clarissa and away bustled sir matthew's public advertiser to spread the glorious news of private theatricals at dowling lodge throughout the country she paused for one moment however as she passed michael and putting her hand upon his head so as to make him turn his face up towards her she said after looking at him very earnestly well now for a beggar child he is to be sure the genteelest looking little fellow i ever did see but perhaps that may be owing to his being so pale and thin which is certainly a great deal more elegant than fatness and red cheeks though it don't quite seem so healthy oh he is in perfect health i do assure you mrs gabberly as you would have said if you had seen the dear little fellow eating his luncheon with us just now said the amiable sir matthew chucking him under the chin but by the way continued the merry knight i rather suspect that i called him away before he had quite finished and that's what makes him look so doleful isn't it dear well never be ashamed about it go back again there's a darling and don't forget to take a nice bit home to mother and brother do you hear michael pretty fellow how he blushes and here the benevolent sir matthew himself opened the door leading to the dining-room and playfully pushed the darling through it well now again exclaimed the astonished mrs gabberly did ever anybody see such a beautiful spectacle of charity as that and without waiting for any reply the brisk little lady made her exit without further pause or delay of any kind and so completely charged to the top of her bent with wonderful intelligence that she actually suffered from the repletion till half a dozen gossipings had relieved it meanwhile the party she left resolved themselves into a committee of management upon the business in hand mr osmond norval was entreated to urge his eloquent pen with the greatest possible rapidity while on his part sir matthew promised that the necessary workmen should immediately be employed in preparing one of the largest rooms in the house as a theatre when the consultation reached this point lady dowling suddenly rose and left the room but this circumstance did not appear to produce much emotion in any of the party and they remained together in a most delightful state of hubbub and excitement till the heiress grew tired and ventured to hint that she thought it would be best for her to drive home first and then sent her carriage back for the accommodation of her noble friend this proposal brought the meeting to a conclusion but not till lady clarissa had confessed in a whisper to sir matthew that she never in her whole life remembered to have taken anything that did her so much good as the delicious grapes he had sent home with her the evening before End of chapter seven